Hello and welcome back to Retrospection. My name's McKay and this is Tyler. And we're going to talk about some stuff. So let's get started. <laughs> Uh, you'll notice that we're taking a bit more of a relaxed approach to the podcast today. We've got some lav mics that we're trying out, um, and we don't have a table in front of us, so that's fun. <laughs> yep. But uh, I think we'll start with our main, well, not our main topic, but one, we've got two big topics, and the first one is Sony versus Microsoft in concerns of Activision. So... This one's particularly fun because over the past, say, maybe even half a year now, we've seen <laughs> Microsoft's gunning for Activision Blizzard, and then we have Sony retaliating because they really don't want that to happen because they really want Call of Duty. And most of the discussion is about Call of Duty, which makes this hilarious. Um, <laughs> but uh, we just listened to a video from Spawnwave. Uh, kind of summarizing a situation about it. Um, tell me, what are your initial thoughts about it? Well, my initial thought is how worried is Sony that this will affect their actual business? Because if one game made by a third-party developer is going to ruin your game system, you probably don't deserve to be around anyways. Probably just let you die out. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I think it's funny. Um, Sony, obviously, they're, they're at the top every generation. They're, I don't think they have anything to worry about. Um, one of the things, so I got into an argument, not an argument, but like, you know, I made a comment on a Twitter post and some people responded, but pretty much what they were saying was um, just like Sony's what I was saying is Sony is so tied into uh, their advertising with Call of Duty. You know, they like to slap Call of Duty on everything PlayStation so that when people think, I want to play Call of Duty, they think, I want to get a PlayStation for Call of Duty. And I think that's where their worry lies. You know, PlayStation's actually been doing that sort of thing since the beginning. And back in the day, it was like Crash Bandicoot PlayStation. Mm -hmm. They always had the game that, that they stuck in like the forefront of the console, which I guess. makes it even more hilarious because Activision Blizzard owns Crash Bandicoot as well. <laughs> so, uh, so Xbox would get that too. But um, uh, I'm, that's honestly something they should learn from and change. Like, it's fine to do that with a game that you develop yourself, but if there's any. Like, even if you have a deal, like, they had a deal. That's why they were doing it. They have a deal mm -hmm. with them. Yep. But deals mm -hmm. expire, and things like this happen. Yeah. And so you you shouldn't base your whole console around a game. You have no control over like that. What's funny is, you know, Sony's been on top for pretty much ever since they started in, like, 1994 with PlayStation. But... Sony's a much smaller company than Microsoft is. I don't know how they compare to Nintendo, but that doesn't really matter anyways. But it's You're just funny. To the gaming portions of the company or the company in general? Like whole. The company as a whole. Microsoft is way bigger. <laughs> okay. So they have like they have all the buying power, and I think that's where Sony's really concerned is because they probably haven't purchased these because they can't uh they can't What's the word I'm looking for? Justify. They can't justify that making cost. such a large purchase when right. their company is not even... I have no know. idea. I'd be curious to see how much of Sony's market share is their gaming versus everything else they do, like TVs and stuff. But Yeah. I'm sure it could be easily looked up, but I'm too lazy. I think, if I remember correctly, and I could be completely wrong, but they're... Gaming could be, their gaming and their cinematography or their cinema departments could be like the biggest ones, uh, but I think gaming's bigger. But I'm not entirely sure. I really don't think they make all that much off of hardware 
anymore. Well, it's hard to be a, <laughs> I guess, cinematography like. Phone, oh. Phones do just about everything these days. I mean, but, they're. And they're, then there's still like. Well, I mean, even making movies. Oh, like that's the time. I don't remember like movie their production. cameras and. Oh yeah, they're. I mean, their cameras are good. <laughs> they but make funds too. But there's Canon and. Yeah, Canon yeah. brought to you, for the retrospection brought to you with by a Canon camera, not <laughs> sponsored, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, personally, I never liked their TVs, so. I've never tried them. <laughs> All I remember is like CRTs. Well, in the internet business, the TV with the most internet problems tends to be the Sony TV. <laughs> so there's that good piece is, of info. Are you sure it's you. not Vizio? Because they <laughs> suck. I hate Vizio. Not sure. <laughs> anyone, anyone with a Vizio just uses a Roku or something. So <laughs> <laughs> That's me. Um, <clears throat> but back to the deal. <laughs> with Sony and Microsoft. Um, well, I mean, what what are the gamers concerned about, I guess? I know what Sony's concerned about. The gamers worried that, like, there'll be a monopoly, so, so they won't have choices. That's a pretty good transition into these posts I was talking about. Because um, this brings up some people who did respond, who are gamers, real gamers responding. <laughs> um, so the, I saw this Twitter post from Salt King. Uh, I don't have his at. Sorry, <laughs> he's not verified. Um, not that that will matter soon. Um, but he said in a recent interview, Jim Ryan dropped a bomb, all in caps, uh, in regards to the Microsoft Activision acquisition. He said the choices that gamers have today are likely to disappear <sighs> if the deal goes through. Gloves are off now, boys and girls. Which means, you know, I mean. It's just, PlayStation's getting into fisticuffs. <laughs> if our choices were dependent on Activision and Blizzard, the gaming industry was dead already. <laughs> so, uh, exactly. <laughs> Not that they don't have a good game or two, like Call of Duty, but... <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, I left a response, and I said, you know, just shooting out in the dark, exclusivity sucks for gamers, but we do have a choice to not play on an Xbox. If there really is a void to be filled in those genres, then other developers will likely step up and fill in in some way. And by that I mean if Xbox goes exclusive to Xbox, <laughs> then something like either Sony themselves will step up or someone else will release something. There will be something on PlayStation. That's my theory. When it comes... I said, Sony is being a fear monger because they're afraid of losing the lead. <laughs> but what were you going to say? I'm surprised they've been the lead. I feel like it's I, I feel like I, in my mind it has been Xbox, but that's because they're own. they're just doing so many friendly things right now for but the consumers. Like <laughs> if a company was going to buy another gaming company, and I was worried about exclusivity. I'd be least worried about Microsoft purchasing that <laughs> because they've been the most friendly in the gaming market as far as cross platform and putting their games out on other things. Well, they have been recently, but we all remember the launch of the Xbox one <laughs> and how miserable yeah. that was. But I don't know. It all just kind of depends. This is why it's weird. It's hard to base a company on their own history because that history is not i mean a lot of times there's culture in a company like workplace culture but a lot of other times it's based off of who's leading like right. uh you know a lot of the leadership for xbox back when the xbox one launched they were really cocky they weren't very smart and they got replaced <laughs> which is why xbox is where it is now and some well some of them were humble and learned a lot yeah that's not it's not to say that Xbox is going to always be friendly to the consumers. There could be, you know, somebody could retire. Something but, could change. I mean, but... you have to look at who's calling the shots. I mean, look at a company like Nintendo. There's mm -hmm. not been much change in the leadership. So you can pretty much expect the same thing. Yeah. Because nothing changes. <laughs> they don't improve the things that need it. They have the same quirky Nintendo's things weird. need to be the way we want it to be. And you... 
and you don't expect change because the leadership hasn't changed much. <laughs> the Xbox, I think a lot of the leadership has moved around since the first. Yeah, definitely. This one guy, this one guy responded and said, in regards to me choosing not to play on Xbox, he said, that's unfortunately not really how that works in gaming. People follow Call of Duty. This isn't a Call of Duty is gone. We will just make a competitor. Call of Duty has competition. They all constantly fail or died. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, he has somewhat of a point. Call of Duty is really popular. And people will follow Call of Duty. Um, uh, yeah, if, if people follow Call of Duty away from Sony... I mean, what is he worried about? That he'll have to buy an Xbox instead of buy the next PS whatever? Like, he's still I mean, going to get to play Call of Duty. He's just going to choose a different console. I and mean, if Sony is all... If Call of Duty is all Sony has to offer anyways, he should be thrilled to get onto <laughs> Xbox because Xbox has more than just one game. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I actually haven't seen it in that perspective because that really discredits Sony. Like, Sony's kind of discrediting themselves through all this. <laughs> it's like, are you so worried that you don't have something good enough to offer? Well, this guy discredited Sony. It's like, he seems worried that he's going to have to move away <laughs> from Sony for Call of Duty. And it's like, well, if that's all Sony has to offer, what do you care if you're moving away from Sony? You're still going to get Call of Duty <laughs> and you're going to get more. I mean, obviously, Sony has more to offer. But I'm not a huge Sony fan, so I don't know off the top of my head what they have. Well, I mean, if you're if you're an outsider and you look at what Sony has to offer, a lot of it is third person, single player, story driven campaigns that are all pretty similar if you just take it at a glance. So you could look at Sony and say, "There's not a whole lot there." That's not true, because all those games are really great. <laughs> and there is more that Sony's working on, but I don't know. That's an interesting perspective that I hadn't really considered. Um, my response to this guy was to say, Sony kind of made their own bed here, though. And I brought up uh, their Call of Duty advertising. I said, people will follow Call of Duty, but part of that is because Sony has pushed Call of Duty so hard in their own advertising for the PlayStation. They had exclusive deals to have that advertising, and now it's blowing up in their face. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what I was saying. So, and then I, I did a clarification. I said, Sony has IPs they could raise as a competitor, but instead of investing in those IPs, they invested in advertising and pushing Call of Duty. <laughs> right. They're like, and I'm... I Which mean, makes I sense. I mean... You know, up until this point, it's been a good decision for them because they didn't have to make the game. They didn't have to put in that development cost. The game's already there. They just walked over and were like, hey, uh, we uh, have a really good selling console. You have a really good selling game. Let's uh, let's do something here. And it's worked out great until now. <laughs> right. So, <clears throat> I don't know. It's funny. I should have pulled up more from from big fans cuz like I don't feel like this guy is <laughs> this sounds rude but I want to describe them as rabid. Like sometimes fans that are just so set on their their think, they get kind of rabid <laughs> yeah. about it. But no. this guy wasn't so much. I mean, he wasn't like foaming <laughs> the no. mouth. This could be because I don't, I'm not the biggest RPG fan, and so I'm not extremely familiar. But when I try and think of like a game that is like the reason someone, one of the big reasons someone would buy a PlayStation in the last five years, <laughs> the only game that comes to my mind is like the Spider Man, which just recently was released on other. Well, it was things. released on. The computer. That's the it. Computer. Sony has been releasing things on the computer, and I've seen some funny responses to that too, because there are people rooting for Sony to fail on the PC. And it's like, why? <laughs> why would you want that? It's interesting because. If you could get a bigger player base excited about the same games you're playing, why would you not want that? <laughs> 
I don't understand. But you had a thought. Yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, it is a different market, I guess. So, I don't know. It's interesting because how how is that any different than them just selling it on like their direct competitor, like Xbox? Why why didn't they do that? Why did they do the PC? Well, that's the question, though, right? What's the difference between the PC and any other platform? I think part of the difference is that <laughs> there's there's a bigger disconnect in the player base. People that play consoles will switch between them. People that play on the PC, they don't like. They're less. I feel like they're less likely to switch to a console. Well, because that's, I mean, you, when you build a PC or you buy, even buy a PC, your investment is so much higher than buying a console in the first place. So then, I mean, for me, as a PC-centered gamer, why would I go out and buy both of those consoles to play what I want? I mean, most of Xbox is on the PC anyways, but right. why would I get a Sony? I don't know. For, it's, for me, it's also the mouse and keyboard, like... If you're someone who's really good at mouse and keyboard, playing with a controller, to a controller is not is, exciting. <laughs> it's not fun. It's hard, and I suck at it. So I don't play with a controller. I've very spent often. years conditioning myself to be okay with playing with a controller. <laughs> so, it's, so it took some time. It, it is a market that I feel like already has some disconnect. So if you're going to choose one other console or, or method to distribute a game, that would be the best pick obviously i think it's funny but, uh it's can we talk about the steam deck a lot as of recent but i tying the steam deck into it the more friendly pc gaming gets for consumers the more interesting i think it gets because at some point if pc gaming gets easier and easier to jump into at some point there's going to be people who will be like well why do i need a playstation if I can just have everything on my PC. <laughs> well, part of the part of the problem I think is that the actual console market is not as profitable these days. I mean it it, it may not have been even That's a really in good the past. Point. <laughs> like Sony was losing money on the PS3. Um somehow they levied that for exclusive games to make the money, but like at some point when you're not making really any money on a console that you're putting out and you're like, oh, somebody else is putting out uh, different avenues for playing games, and I have this game, why wouldn't I want to take that and give that to as many options as possible? Yeah. Uh... <laughs> it's similar to the push for everything on the uh, Switch. Switch. The Pets Initiative. <laughs> yes. like, Port everything to the Switch. <laughs> because the Switch is so popular, and everyone's getting it, and everyone loves love the ability to play mobile that was like get your game on there you want your game on there because it's a bigger market share the switch so. is an interesting topic as of late because you know a couple of years ago when we were first doing this podcast in like 2018 it was really exciting to have things ported to the switch and now we've reached a point where every time we hear about a port coming to Switch, we're like, okay, well, there's a 50-50 chance. It's either going to be massive, awful, horrible port that runs terribly, or it's going to be mind-blowing. <laughs> That's far cry better than ports to Nintendo consoles used to be. <laughs> it used to be there's well, you... a 99% chance it's utter failure. Well, <laughs> well it used to be... We're going to make this Call of Duty, for example. We're going to have Call of Duty here. And then we're going to... Here, you developer, make make this, make it but work. for the Switch. And it's just a from the ground up different game. <laughs> yeah. Which used to happen a lot, especially on the Wii. There was one, I think, Call of Duty that was like the same. But it was just so massively different in control style that they couldn't even, like, there was hardly a connection between um, <laughs> different consoles. But I mean, it sounds like that this sale of Activision really only affects Sony. Other companies don't <laughs> care. I mean, Nintendo is a big player in the gaming 
kind of a big player, and like they don't seem to care. Well, Sony doesn't even get Call of Duty. Call of Duty's not on the Switch. <laughs> Or, I mean, Nintendo. Right. Nintendo doesn't get Call of Duty. Nintendo doesn't get Call of Duty. But I just mean in general how this would affect the gaming industry in general is just... It's really... It won't really... It's not as big as... Affect it that much. Yeah, it's not as big as Sony's making it out to be. just Sony pretending like it's the end of the world and Microsoft pretending like Call of Duty's barely a game at all. (laughs) Yeah, it's so funny. (laughs) Uh, What what was it that Spawn Wave said that they... They were quoted as like it's not a, it's not a necessary. No, I don't remember how he phrased it, but it I was mean, like a, they are basically saying it's not going to kill Sony. Yeah, like it, for sure, and I think that's true. I don't think it will. <laughs> like it's a, it's the the problem is it's going to lose them some revenue, and that's most of what they're worried about. It's going to lose them <laughs> revenue, and it means that they're in a place of uncertainty. They had certainty of like, we can bundle our advertising with Call of Duty and make this money. And now the uncertainty is, oh, we have to come up with something ourselves now. Yeah. Like, So there's some uncertainty. We're going to lose some money probably. We have to figure out something to replace this. I think Xbox is just trying so hard to get whatever they can on their platform so that they can be relevant. <laughs> I don't know. This whole thing is just so funny to me. Um, but yeah, I don't know what else. I mean, we just got to keep watching, have our popcorn yep. to the side. <laughs> uh, a lot of the YouTubers I watch seem pretty certain that it's going to go through, that the deal is going to hit. Um, MVG is a guy. He appears on the Spawn cast a lot, and he seems to think that um, that the deal will go through. He works in the industry a little bit, so yeah, it's interesting. We'll see. So now it's time for us to discuss. I've had a lot of trouble deciding how to approach the discussion of Nintendo going third party as like a is it a pipe dream? Is it? Uh, something to theorize about or do we you know factually talk about it and it was really hard I tried to go the factual route it was really hard to find numbers to support anything that I wanted to discuss so like I tried comparing Sega because they did go third party but I couldn't find anything concrete there weren't there wasn't any articles focusing on like how did Sega adjust when they dropped the Dreamcast in 1990 or 2000, whatever. 99, I mean. Um, But I've always thought it was interesting um, to think about, like, what what would happen if Nintendo went third party? What would that look like? And I think (laughs) the thing to start with is the pipe dream of, like, you go into the Steam store. And then you search Nintendo, and the first result is Nintendo Complete Pack. (laughs) (laughs) That's like my my uh, my pipe dream, basically. Um, Well, and I think any if we're going to be honest, I think any semblance of them going third party is is a pipe dream because um, I don't know. I don't know. I want to say they're just too proud or. They're, they seem to be a very proud company, yeah. <laughs> uh, something like that to to ever do it, but um, you know what'd be nice is if they went and found a third party to set up their online. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, that's one of the discussion points for me. If Nintendo were to go third party, would their online get any better? Because they'd still have to host their own servers. Yeah, for games. So, I mean, the structure could change, um, but I guess that depends on if they went exclusive to a platform. Because take a look at like Fortnite. For Fortnite to work, you have your Epic Games account, and that's what it's centered on. And then your Epic's game, your Epic Games account, 
attaches to Xbox and attaches to PlayStation and I don't know what the freak it does with Nintendo, but <laughs> <laughs> I think it attaches to Nintendo. But basically, that Epic account is what facilitates the matchmaking in the game. You can go into the game, find your Epic friends, invite them to your your little group, your posse, whatever. So, yeah. like, if Nintendo wanted a cross-platform thing, that's what they'd have to do. Unless they right. were to commission a different company to do it. Say, like, they have Xbox handle it for them. But... So, I mean, what's the benefit to Nintendo is, I don't know, they sell a lot more games, maybe? Like, it's hard to say, like, I don't know for sure how many Switches they've sold in the United States, but it's a lot. Well, I don't know about the United States, but I know they've sold over 114 million. Worldwide. Worldwide. Which is the most they've sold of any console, not counting handhelds. Right, there's 300 <laughs> some odd million Think... people in the United States, but I don't know how many families there are. <laughs> yeah. But let's say, I mean, you're thinking of all the people that don't, that maybe never bought a Switch. Um, they're, they're, they have Mario Kart on the PlayStation or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's interesting so, you just mentioned something that had my my brain thinking, but I forgot what it was. Um, I think one thing that's interesting is talking about their hardware. Oh, yeah. You mentioned uh, the Switch, how many sales. Um, we know that Nintendo is pretty much the only company in the gaming industry right now that makes money off of their hardware. And I saw an article... I don't know how accurate it is, but it said that the cost of making a Nintendo Switch, I think with the dock, the Joy-Cons, everything included, was like $257. And <clears throat> if that's true, then they're making about $40 a Switch sold, except for the old LED is a $350. So, I don't know, but... That's an interesting discussion. No, what you mentioned was um, they'd sell a lot more games. And one of the questions I had was, would the increase of amount of games they sold counterbalance the money that they would no longer be making off of hardware sales? Right. <laughs> it's hard to say. I mean, you if you pay any attention to like Nintendo stock, I mean, a lot of it, a lot of the company's focus is on how many units of the Switch they sell. Mm -hmm. But but the hard thing to dictate or to know is whether that is because of the money made on the console itself or because of the potential money made on the games for that console once it's sold. Because they have to own a Switch to start buying Mario Kart and Mario and Link or Zelda, and whatever else. Yeah. <clears throat> so is that the reason that they look closely at the sales, or is it because Nintendo actually has decent profits straight off of the console itself? And I imagine it's probably more of trying to focus on the games, the sales of the games, because, I don't know, I could see them viewing the money from consoles being kind of like a bonus. Like, they managed to get this old Tegra X1 processor to work inside their console, and they basically <laughs> paid dirt for it. <laughs> right. And they're probably like, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. Right. I, I mean, but that just allowed them to sell it for cheaper. It didn't allow them to make more off of it. Yeah. Which helped True. their sales overall to sell it for cheaper, but... Um, that's a good point too because uh, you know the cheaper it costs to make the cheaper they can make it the more they can sell the more games they can sell yeah so <laughs> i don't know and i don't know are they making any money off of the the mini <laughs> i have no clue <laughs> 
because that seems to be one that has sold a lot as well. And like nowadays that seems like the, the better choice. I mean, for someone like when it comes to portable gaming, it's like if you're an adult and you're going to spend 300 bucks, maybe spend a hundred more and get the steam deck. But if you're a kid, spend a hundred less and get your kid the, the switch. Portable. I can see it for for kids for sure. Would you be surprised if I told you that that's a choice a lot of people aren't making? <laughs> what do you mean? The the Switch Lite. Uh, I think there was a report a little while back that said that Nintendo was disappointed in how little the Switch Lite was being sold, and I think. I mean, in the case of kids, yeah, for sure, you'd probably get your kid a Switch Lite. But I think most people, most consumers, when they look between the Switch and the Switch Lite, they go, well, I want the option well, to play on the TV. <laughs> I think that's true. The option is there. I think another thing to consider, though, is um, think about the DS. Um, <laughs> my guess would be there's actually a a decent chunk of difference between how many kids a family would have 10 years ago or 15 years ago, whenever the DS was out compared to now. That's true. So then it's like, if I've got one or two kids, like the need for their own personal console is less because they're able to better share the one console. All of a sudden you have five kids then you got those kids like prying for their own a lot harder. Yeah. So. That's possibly could be just pulling this out of my butt, but no, I mean, something our, to think about. Sounds like me as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I don't know. Yeah, I can, I can see that for sure. Um, let's see. Uh, I I was wondering if Nintendo were to go third party, what would their ports look like? Um, we've got a pretty good example of Sega. Um, have you ever played Sonic Adventure Two Battle on the computer? No. <laughs> so basically, what Sega did, you know, usually when you get a console port nowadays, you get, you know, there's the options menu, like there always is. But in the options menu, there's a whole lot more settings added on. And that's specifically for the PC, because every PC is different. And so they let you tinker around with the settings and get whatever you want, because otherwise you could have a crappy experience. What Sega's done is they're like, we're going to add in some of these settings, not as detailed, but we're going to put it in a launcher in front of the game. (laughs) So when when you go to launch Sonic... 2 on or Sonic Adventure 2 on the computer you get launch options and one of them I think is the settings and it pops up a window you can customize the controls there you can customize the graphics there but once you launch the game that's it you're in the game it looks exactly the same as it did on the GameCube it's the game no no extra options nothing <laughs> see when I think of Nintendo porting a game like that their pride comes back to mind. And I feel like (laughs) what you'll get is this game is good just how it is. You don't need to change any settings. You don't need to up any graphics. We're just, they got it set to like this low setting. Yeah. And then you don't need to up anything because they're like, this is good. We made the game. It's good how it is. I was looking up uh, opinions about it and somebody said something pretty similar. Uh, They... I think it was a question on Quora, actually. (laughs) But somebody was like, do you think, do you really think that Nintendo would launch a game on the PlayStation and have it push the hardware? Probably not. (laughs) (laughs) But then they said something really stupid that was like, Nintendo games don't even push the Switch hardware. I was like, (laughs) (laughs) have you played Breath of the Wild in the Quora? The... The the forest, whatever it's called, the Korok. Yeah. 
that's uh they're pushing the hardware <laughs> they're for sure pushing that hardware but it was a good point like nintendo usually they know how to make a game look really good without right. absolutely destroying like you know even a lot of the higher fidelity nintendo games on the switch will last longer battery power wise than a lot of the other triple a ports yeah. because they're just made so well for the switch oh part of me part of me wants to believe that they would have such pride in their games that they'd be like it's on the playstation it looks amazing we up like we made it so the graphics go way high <laughs> and like but then like realistically that just doesn't sound like them yeah like yeah Um, so I had another point that I was thinking about, and that was Nintendo's recent focus to be more of a media company than just a gaming company. They want to be an entertainment company, basically. They're, they're building theme parks in collaboration with Universal and stuff. They're making a movie, probably more movies. Um, they have, you know, more experiences than that. Um, but we see them branching out. Would them going third party make more sense in, in that light? In that light, it does. I mean, you kind of think of them like turning it into a brand like, like Mickey Mouse or Disney, like, turning Mario into like where wherever they can put him and and make money off of this brand like and in that case it feels like it would make more sense but i don't know that worries me a little because when i start to think of it like a mickey mouse i think of a drop in quality that's what i like, was just thinking about like Oh no, they're going to push a Mario game to every console. When you but see... instead of making it a really good Mario game, it's just going to be like a shizzy kids game. When you see a Disney branded video game, it's like almost always a, ooh, stay away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it's not going to be great. Um, but in contrast, we can look at other companies, say like uh, Square Enix. They've got a really good name to themselves. And when they make a game, um, right now they're in cahoots a lot with PlayStation, but they they do have IPs that they port everywhere. And you know that when they make a game, most of the time it's going to be pretty decent. Um, I mean, there's a lot of IPs that they used to own that they just barely uh, got rid of, like uh, Tomb Raider and... What else does Square Enix work on? <laughs> <laughs> there were a couple like Tomb Raider, but I can't think of them right now. But, um, you know, those were good games. They weren't mind-blowing, but, right. you know. So you think, like, if Nintendo were to go third-party and they handled it right, then you could see a similar reaction. Say, like, you know, Bethesda games aren't known for their amazing quality, but they are really popular, and it's because of their, I think, because of the stories they tell them the way they tell them and the humor that they have in their games. Um, and you could have something similar to that. I mean, Bethesda's now owned by Xbox, but, you know, <laughs> for taking the example of, you know, from now past, where, like, Nintendo could be one of those names where, like, ooh, get a Nintendo game on PlayStation or Xbox, you know, Nintendo's releasing their next Zelda game. Right. It's like, it could be viewed in a very good light. It just kind of depends on you know how they handled or how they handle everything right but i mean in they might be branching out into all these different things because they might be a little concerned about their gaming sector i mean think about so they tend to not want to make something unless they can throw a new twist on it right yeah. And so it's always, I'm sure, quite a challenge. The new Mario game was throwing a hat on things. That was the twist the game had. And it, 
hopefully they can continue to think of something that, yeah. that, that they can make a new game on. But there's also like Mario Kart where the new thing for Mario Kart was the gravity, the gravity upside down levels. But that didn't end up being as cool as the as it looked in commercials because you almost don't notice <laughs> that you're going upside down. Unless it shows you sideways. That's right. when my head starts to turn. <laughs> and in those cases, it's not as cool as it is annoying or <laughs> whatever. But, I mean, look at... So they're coming out with all these new levels for Mario Kart, and my thought is like, Mario Kart's kind of peaked. In my eyes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you think about what they could do next, it's really uh, it's really hard to think, like, what do they do next? They've already gone carts underwater. They've had them gliding. What do they go Diddy Kong racing and have full-on flight? <laughs> <laughs> like that, like, I, it's just a Star Fox game. or <laughs> Like, I don't know. Yeah, it's so, I don't know. The gimmicks are something to think about, too. And Nintendo, you talk about them being concerned, and it's because of their focus on gimmicks, I think, that they've seen some of the biggest fluctuations that any company has. I mean, the GameCube was their low point. They did, like, somewhere in the range of 20 million units of the GameCube sold, which is so tiny. The N64 was, like, 36 million before that. So they were on a downward curve, and then all of a sudden, the Switch does 111 million units or something like that. Maybe yeah, it was they, 101. I don't remember. They had the the Wii, which did... That was the Wii. Did I say the Wii? You said Switch. Oh, the Wii did that much. Yeah. So it was just like... And then they did the Wii U, and it was even lower than the GameCube was. in. Yeah. So... And the Wii U is a a little more unique in its in its uh, failure because I think unlike the GameCube which failed because it because of a ton of reasons part of it was the disc size ports not not being worth moving to it whatever else it was yeah the Wii U was a whole different thing it was just like people did not understand it was Marketing a new thing disaster <laughs> they thought it was a screen for their Wii and they're like that's a lot of money for an addition to the Wii I ain't buying that <laughs> Yeah, historically, if, I mean, we've seen it over and over again. Attachments for consoles that add capability do not do well. The Sega Genesis 32X did horrible. It's supposed to add a CD drive and more capability. Did It was a disaster. <laughs> the N64 DD drive, disc, <laughs> disc attachment, did horrible. <laughs> yeah. So, um... Yeah, so people, when they think something's an attachment, it doesn't usually track too well. <laughs> so the question for the gamer is, like, what is the benefit to Nintendo s sticking with their model? Like, and it's hard to say, because, like, the Wii... And I don't know how arguable this is. It might have just been something I thought it as I was younger, but it seemed like Nintendo kind of set the stage for controller design as time went on a little bit. With the Wii? or With every console. Yeah. I mean, if they were one of the first with an actual controller to begin with, not yeah. a joystick. Yeah, the D-pad. The D-pad uh, started on the Game & Watch, and they made it big with the NES. And then the Super Nintendo is still the basic layout of controllers nowadays. <laughs> but, and the the GameCube controller wasn't the best, but... Well, the GameCube controller is highly regarded, but its layout was a little strange. Right. So, I don't know. That was one of my questions, too, is if Nintendo did go third party, would they... Would they go like an 8-bit dough and make their own controllers? Like, this is the official Nintendo controller compatible with Xbox. <laughs> compatible with PlayStation. And just kind of I mean, make their own experiences that way. At this point, it doesn't seem like something they care to do. They've 
outsourced a they lot have. of their controller making. Every GameCube controller is. that is wireless and capable of communicating with the Switch is not a first party. <laughs> yeah, so, so they've outsourced the vast majority of that. Seems like they just don't care for that. But so, but like, could... what innovations do we lose? Like, I mean, the Wii had a lot of motion stuff. Um, well, here's another question: What innovations? Does it matter if we lose? So right. the Wii did really well. It was the Wii did well, but and, it and it was like a magical time for the world where everybody had a Wii and was playing motion sports and uh, whatever. It, but it didn't shape no like the gaming world. <laughs> what happened was other companies just took their normal controllers and added motion to them. <laughs> But how much and of that a role the did standard. Nintendo's motion, did Nintendo's Wii, how much of a role did that play in other developers putting motion in their controllers? Well, the PlayStation did already, the PS3 the play, already had it. It already had the six axis controller. So <laughs> who knows? I It's hard to say. Because oh. the Wii U, that was more of like a fun gimmick the Wii probably helped with vr more than <laughs> than standard gaming but that's i don't know true. that's the that's why i asked the question it's like any of the gimmicks any of the big gimmicks we've seen especially with the switch you know you've got the you've got ring fit adventure you have uh cardboard uh vr what, what is it called cardboard. <laughs> any of the cardboard stuff like okay that was cool. It was like a mirror of the Wii, though, but shortened really fast within a year. It was like tons of people were like, "Wow, look at this! Why Labo? Labo? Look at yeah. look at Labo! This is amazing!" And then it just nobody cares. Because Cardboard in the gimmick, closet. <laughs> like... So, like, I mean, it's Nintendo could still do that kind of stuff. They would just have peripherals that would be compatible with whatever console well they they were able look at their games on like the wii so they specifically were able to do a few very unique games like skyward sword for example where the game itself takes full advantage of the point and click and the swinging of the mm -hmm. whatever it is it takes full advantage of that console's gimmick um and the question is, did that make that gaming experience worth it? <laughs> I mean, because at one point someone said, the motion stuff is fun and all, but I'm a gamer and I just want my controller back. And and that's kind of what it felt like it got to. Like yeah. you see people playing the Wii with the swinging of the sword and it turns into like moving your wrist, the bare minimum. It's, and it ends up just being more annoying than anything. Like, I'm, yeah. Like I don't know. It can feel empowering sometimes to like, I've got to swing the perfect direction to get this to work. But a lot of times it could also just be more frustrating. Well, I yeah. To your point, look at all the big games, like the big massive Nintendo games on the Switch right now: Breath of the Wild, Super Mario Odyssey, Mario Kart Eight. Um, any Pokemon game, any Kirby game, none of them have gimmicks. None of them have the gimmicks. <laughs> they're all standard controller games, and I think that says a lot. And they're doing, <laughs> and they're doing as good as they're doing they ever could. Great. <laughs> so I'm not sure what we lose. You look at the Switch though itself. I mean, it, there were handheld consoles out when the switch came out like the um what is it you have the gpd gpd win. win things like that existed it's not like nintendo invented the concept or anything but they did propel that into popularity but, yeah so something like because of nintendo's place in the market they were able to take the that handheld market and just explode it 
out. Now, I think their reason for designing something like the Switch had a lot more to do with Japan than <laughs> anything else because yeah. Japan handheld consoles have always been more popular. Yeah, they. I mean, Nintendo's rocked the handheld world. They've they've been like Sony for the consoles, but for handhelds, they're the Sony of handhelds. Basically, they've been on top every single generation for handhelds, and I don't think they could give that up. And the only way, I think, the split between handhelds and console has been a big problem for them for years. I think. <laughs> right. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe they viewed it as a problem, like a real problem within their company, like having to focus in two different places. Right. Could have caused a lot of difficulty for them <laughs> over the years. Yeah. So the solution was to combine both. And I remember, uh, I remember, well, I do remember specifically Pokemon Go. I remember that exact moment when I tried it. But I do remember when they announced the Switch in October of 2016 and seeing it being able to switch between <laughs> the TV and handheld. And I remember that being such a novel concept. Just like... You're not... I mean, the portability, the the concept of being able to switch between the two on the spot was in the Wii U. You could play on the little screen mm, and but... not the TV, which I think was another attempt for them to like get a higher market of consoles sold in Japan. Yeah, true. Was Your to kid make doesn't it. need a TV in order to play. Make, yeah, because you don't need a, t a TV. But So the Switch, I think, kind of pushed things... It kind of, because of their place in the market, it basically let the world see how much a handheld could actually succeed. Yeah. How much that of a market that could take. We could argue that that's why this, the Steam Deck exists now. Is right. If the Switch didn't come out, would Valve have done the Steam Deck? <laughs> right. I mean, it was a big risk, and... They'd already taken big risks like that and failed miserably with uh, St Steam, Steam Machine. Machine. <laughs> so it was risky, but once the Switch like showed the world that, like, assuming it's not crazily overpriced, people want that. Like, and obviously they don't have the. They're not. They're never going to have the same market share. No. That the Switch has, but. <laughs> So it's it's a niche market already for them, but it but I think it I think Nintendo paved the way for them. So it's kind of like in the future, what will Nintendo do? Like, yeah, what? And it, I feel like whether it's a good thing or not depends more on are they pushing new technologies because they've always tried that. They've always tried to like push new technologies and do things that were unique and and sometimes those technologies helped and sometimes they were just gimmicks the and yeah. what you think it is is probably uh, not is arguable like you've got the NES gun or or like the virtual boy like these were technologies they were trying to like take advantage of and use and some failed and some were good but some were still gimmicky so like if it's gimmicky it's probably not that helpful to the gaming community but if it's like taking the next technologies then yeah it, then it could be helping to push the gaming industry in a better direction yeah I think ultimately it might come down to that, like, do we miss out on any of those pushes if Nintendo were to go third party? And you could say, like, you know, Nintendo and Xbox could get all buddy-buddy and they could communicate really well on the next Xbox hardware or something. Who knows? But right now, Nintendo gets to do what they want 
but whether that, it works out or not <laughs> but that's that's the thing is uh nintendo has not been historically great at that whole team up and and i think it's because they're set in their ways and while they're like a big company they don't I don't think they deal with the same bureaucracy that a company like Microsoft does. No. There's a lot of red tape for Microsoft <laughs> to do things, which means a lot of hurdles and a lot of like compromises probably. Well, let's say Xbox Xbox as a cuz Xbox is a company, right? Owned by Microsoft? It's a separate entity, is it? I don't I don't know how much. I don't know. But whether it is or isn't, uh, the Xbox bubble still has to answer to Microsoft as a whole. Yeah. Where Nintendo, it's more of like Nintendo of America has to do what Nintendo itself wants. Yeah. <laughs> but Nintendo itself can do whatever they want. They don't have but to like, answer to anybody but their shareholders. I mean, <laughs> what exactly does Nintendo of America actually do besides kind of be the face of the company over here? Like, I don't know. I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's kind of in their position the whole time. They've been... But uh, I'm trying to remember uh, Nintendo's project with Sony that they planned and were getting ready to launch, which was... The... The Nintendo PlayStation? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm trying to remember if that didn't work out because of Sony or because of Nintendo. Well, I think Nintendo realized they were going to get absolutely raked <laughs> in the deal. <laughs> <laughs> because I think Sony made it all pretty for themselves. Right. Sony set it up like a and large corporation would. That could have pushed Nintendo to be a little bit more... Uh, hands off as far as collaborating with other companies right? because they got burned. <laughs> but then they in turn burned Sony really bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> By backing out. So. Yeah. Well, in a way, I mean, Sony went ahead and launched a console without Nintendo which has in turn been burning Nintendo for yeah years and years. <laughs> I mean, arguably, but... arguably now, you could say that it's not anymore just because Nintendo's distanced themselves so much from the rest of the gaming industry. <laughs> so, yeah, but I feel like it was burning them pretty bad when the GameCube came out. It's, I mean, it's <laughs> it's obvious. Because PlayStation came out, then N64 did, and it didn't do great. And then, uh, you know, they tried really hard with the GameCube, except they didn't try hard enough because they still made those stupid mini discs. <laughs> and it just wasn't working for them. And the moment they were like, we don't care anymore, <laughs> that's when <laughs> everything went up for them. So, right. Uh, it's interesting. But, I mean,. It feels like the most of their games are repeats of games, and so, like, what's in what's original? Like, I think one of the latest originals would be like Splatoon. Nintendo made right. Splatoon. I mean, over the years they've come up with new things. Pikmin came out in the GameCube era. Um, man, if they do more. Like Paper Mario, they've got a lot of cool things they've done over the years, but recently they have not done those things. <laughs> Splatoon's yeah. the newest, and that was on the Wii U, and that was like 2012. Yeah. So, well, and they've done, they did uh, one, two, switch. I don't think that counts. That's as effective as whatever the mini game thing was on the Wii. <laughs> Wii Play. A little it's gimmicky. basically we play. It doesn't matter. And we sports. So yeah, they haven't done anything massive, new. So, um, I mean, they don't necessarily like people complain about like 
rehashing of the same games, but those are the ones that still sell the most, you know. Like a, yeah. a new Mario Kart <laughs> could likely not add much and still probably sell crazy on the next console. I mean, they just add to they all they have to add is one aspect, one new aspect to the game, and then they can just make it every Black Friday deal, just like they do now. <laughs> a very bundle. For five years now, every year, the bundle has been Mario Kart and a Switch. <laughs> yeah. It's never changed. In a couple of years, you were getting a Switch that was a model old. Yeah, the bundle <laughs> was the old Switch, I remember. Oh, and man. the new Switch is far cry better with the power runtime. Yeah. Man, I still have the old one. That's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I have the new one and my wife has the old one so her battery dies way faster than mine <laughs> <laughs> but nintendo as a third party i don't think i don't think it's the worst thing because i think while they've had a lot of success with some gimmicks and they may not be able to do that on other i mean let's be honest they come out with a peripheral for another console have to be pretty dirt cheap and come with the game for it to be for it to sell but if they they have a lot of good games and they've built a lot of good games so if they focused on that alone it, it could be pretty successful for them so <clears throat> percent chance what do you what do you say is the percent chance that they do go third party say in the next 15 20 years 15 to 20 years is maybe 10 say. i don't know i i mean i lean towards one zero to one percent <laughs> i'd say 75 percent to 80 percent chance they stay first party but their their switch has quickly grown irrelevant and it's <laughs> And it's starting to feel like the gaming crash of 85 where there was like an oversaturation of crummy games on the market. Well, Nintendo themselves, <clears throat> all their sports games have been underwhelming. Every one of them. <laughs> yeah. so. And there's just, there's so like, I don't know, it's good and bad. And, and the internet helps, I think, because you have an oversaturation of games. But I think the internet helps filter through good and bad. Yeah. And the fact that they're online and can be rated and you can look at ratings, that helps a lot. Um, but it does feel like what Nintendo specifically did to save the gaming crash of 85, which was vet games on their console, has been thrown out the window. And so it's starting to feel <laughs> like that again, where there's an oversaturation of shizzy games well even in 2018 when i would look through the eShop, i was just a hundred percent lost because i had no idea <laughs> what to go for but their their console i mean it's about time for them to come out with something yeah but they said they're not going to they said they want the switch to be 10 years old 2027 well, <laughs> you think the switch is gonna last that long five more years I don't five think so. Five more years? I think is they it need... only five years old? Yeah. It just feels 17, so much older. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. The average is like, what, seven years? Yeah. And... I don't think the Switch... I don't think the Switch as it is now can make it ten years and stay as relevant. It's hard because it's hard <laughs> they've, they've got a point because... All the new consoles just feel like new consoles don't feel like they did back in the day. No. There's not a huge difference in hardware that makes it like, I don't know, a whole new genre. It just doesn't feel like a whole new genre. Well, yeah. And we've saw it, we saw a lot it of. It doesn't feel like a whole new generation, I guess. Not genre, just we, generation. We saw a lot of a lot of fun technology before the new consoles came out. And it hasn't been utilized nearly as 
you know, and that happens every generation, but I think this generation has been slow because of COVID, because of production, because of, you know, right. shipping and all that, all those problems. But at the same time, you know, so many of these games have la- launched cross generational and it, we're two yeah. years in. We're two I mean, years in. <laughs> I mean, it's partly because of COVID that they were cross generational. You're releasing a game on a console that people can't get a hold of. You're going to want to release it for the old console. But I think another part of the problem is the fact that that game can even be launched on the old console and still feel pretty much like the same game. Yeah. Causes people to think, well, what's so great about the new console then? Why should I go out and buy it? But I think and so that, I don't know, that's where Nintendo does kind of have a point. The only problem is that their hardware is so underpowered. Their, their hardware isn't last generation. It's last, last generation. Yeah. <laughs> that That is the problem. Like The concept itself is okay if their hardware was was up to par. They have a console. You know, it's incredible that this little tiny Android crappy tablet looking thing can play Xbox 360 games. But that's kind of like where the line is. Yeah, you get any higher than that, it's blurry, it's crappy. <laughs> so, and that's yeah. the thing. Like, they're gonna release another big Zelda game on it, um, but what else is there? Like, they didn't gear up to make like a new Mario Kart. They geared up to make new levels for the existing Mario Kart. Like, the <laughs> console feels like it's dying today, and they want it to go another five years. And just hardware wise, it's not. <laughs> It's not going to make it. It's going to get less and l- less ports. Well, I'm look at I, this isn't entirely the Switch's fault, but the new Pokemon performs awful. It's horrible. Pop in everywhere, gi- geometry disappearing, just reloading in cutscenes. It's it's bad, and that is partially or mostly Pokemon Company's fault. Right, but. The hardware, I think, does play a little bit into that because right. there is such a heavy limitation. They're trying to make a game that wows people today on hardware that wowed people 10 years ago. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the uh, the same hardware that powered the NVIDIA G... Or not, the NVIDIA... What was it called? The Shield. The NVIDIA Shield. That was that's old news. <laughs> so so. It's... Anyway, I think that's pretty much it. Will Nintendo go third party? No, <laughs> I don't think so. Would it be cool if they did? Probably, but I think we'd still be dealing with the same issues we are now, as far as their online goes. As far as the effort goes, say they're less important games. Some of them feel a little lackluster. And that stuff, there's not a lot that would change, I feel like, if they did go third party. And maybe that's probably why they won't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But they also have more control if they don't, so. I think we'd lose gimmicks. That would. We'd, yeah. We'd lose some gimmicks, and we probably wouldn't be any worse off. Like, we wouldn't get we wouldn't get the next labo pity darn <laughs> that's too bad <laughs> all righty well i think that'll do it for us today thanks for tuning in and listening uh, if you want to respond to us uh mainly me i'm on twitter it's at mr mckay m-r-m-c-a-y-y-y if you want to yell at me that's fine or you can comment in the YouTube video uh, comment section below. But otherwise, we'll see you next time. Peace. Bye-bye. <laughs>